Hi, I'm Sanjay Majumna. I'm a plastic surgery consultant from Yorkshire. And I thought today for this medicine in a nutshell talk, we'd discuss sutures. Now, sutures to surgeons are very much like medications to um, physicians, in as much as if used properly, they can do a lot of good, but if used incorrectly, they can do a lot of harm. So let's talk about sutures. Now, the first thing we're going to do is have a quick zip through the wound closure throughout history. Just to say lots of stuff has been used, kangaroo tendons, bark fiber, interesting. Now, I found this fascinating little thing where it shows that human hair in a sterile packaging was marketed by Ethicon as a suture material in the past, but that's just history. Now, anybody who's been to an operating theater will see a bewildering array of sutures. And it's very hard to get your head around what to use for what. And the only way to do it properly is to classify sutures, get an idea of what uh, properties they have, and then you can use the correct one for the correct patient and the correct indication. So let's classify them. You can divide them into biological and synthetic, braided and monofilament, absorbable and non-absorbable, and also coated and uncoated. So biological, essentially silk, which is extruded from the silkworm, is the only biological suture used in the United Kingdom now. When I was a young un, cat gut was still in use. It's still used very commonly in many other parts of the world in developing countries. And cat gut, notwithstanding his name, is not from the cat. It's actually from made, made for the intestinal lining of sheep. All the other sutures that we use, proline, vitriol, ethylon, whichever you want to see, are synthetic. Now, the next classification is monofilament or braided. Monofilament, say it is what it says on the tin, it's one filament extruded by a machine, while braided is like a mini rope, and uh, it looks exactly like that. Now, they have different um, characteristics. Monofilament passes easily through tissues because a nice, smooth, singular filament, while braided causes more trauma. And when you're actually passing monofilament or braided through um, a bit of skin, for instance, have a feel of what it feels like going through. And you can see there's a bit more um, friction, what we call drag. And this cause can cause more tissue trauma. Little top trip if you are uh, typically using a braided suture, if you wet it, it causes less drag, less tissue reaction uh, once it's going through. But however, once you put your stitch in, monofilament causes less tissue reaction, as, uh, as you can imagine. But the brain, it sits around, and because a bit rougher, causes more tissue reaction. Monofilament, on the other hand, is difficult to handle, more difficult than braided, and it's harder to knot. The knots want to come apart, because monofilament has this characteristic called memory, which is essential in the monofil suture, want to go back to the shape that it was. And in the packet, it lies in a, like a little curly shape. When you take it out, you'll see it wants to spring back into that, while braided sutures sit quite limply. And because of that, braided sutures are easier to handle and easier to knot. And when you're using them, you will find that that is so. Monofilament, because it's got a nice smooth surface, are less likely to harbor microorganisms, while braided, because it's got nooks and crannies within it, uh, microorganisms can hide um, and much more likely to harbor microorganisms. If you've got an infected wound where there's braided suture, much harder to get rid of it because the antibiotics find it difficult to get inside those nooks and crannies. Monofilament is rigid, however, whilst uh, braided sutures are soft. And this rigid suture causes, can cause a problem uh, because it can, uh, the suture ends when you've cut them can poke the patient like skin sutures and can be uncomfortable. And in extreme situations, the pointy rigid ends can actually um, go into surrounding tissue. So one has to be careful. So examples of monofilament are proline, ethylon, monocryl or PDS. While braided, you've got ethylon, vicryl and silk. And just as an overlap, silk is the only one that is not synthetic. And that is biological. If you look at the next classification, absorbable versus non-absorbable, absorbable gives you relatively shorter term support and examples are vitryl, vitryl rapid, monocryl and PDS. Vitryl rapid is actually um, vitryl but has been modified to get absorbed more rapidly and that's what's called vitryl rapid. Well, non-absorbables are like proline, ethylon, ethibon and silk. Now, you can see that there's again the overlap. So vitryl, vitryl repeat, um, 
silk and ethyl bond are braided, while monocryl and PDS, proline and ethylone are monofilament. Now, when you look at absorbable sutures, terribly important to understand a couple of things. First, absorbable is not dissolvable. The absorption happens by enzymatic degradation or hydrolysis, and the absorption takes a lot longer than the amount of time that the suture can give wound support. The important difference is, let's take vicryl repeat for instance, as an example, after 10 days your vicryl repeat suture is not strong enough to be supporting your wound, but it will hang around for another 32 days on average before it completely disappears from the body by absorption. So you've got another 32 days where you've got this foreign body sticking around like an unwanted guest after a party. And then these foreign bodies can cause in tissue reaction, inflammatory reaction and such like. So one has to be very um, careful and knowing if you're going to use it, one, when, when you should use it. PDS, look at it. 60 days it gives you wound support. So really good. I mean, most tissues would have healed by 60 days. But it'll last for another 180 to 210 days. So important things to remember. So you've now gone through... The classification of sutures, let's go on to the sizing. And anybody who's been to an operating theatre, you'll see a wide array of sizes. You've got the really big ones like one, they're twos and threes. And then you've got the ones with the zero, so four zero or ten zero. And you'll find that the common way of calling it is four o or ten o, but it's actually zero. Ten o is smaller than four o. What is the reason for this um, classification of uh, sizes? Well, history, a little history will tell us. When we first had sutures, people didn't actually classify their sizes because they were using things like horse um, tail and human hair and so on. But then once classification got in, they said, okay, the smallest one will be a one, the bigger one will be a two, and then three, etc., etc. Once they started to manufacture sutures and they got finer and finer thread, so how do we classify that? So the one smaller than a one was a zero, smaller than a zero was two zeros, that is zero zero, like a decimalization if you would, and then three zeros, four zeros, etc, etc, all the way down to twelve zero, which the ophthalmologists are using for eye surgery. The smallest one I've used for plastic surgery are ten zeros and um, eleven zeros, very, very fine suture that you can see, and that's a five pence piece for comparison. So what size of suture do you use for skin? And this is a general guide. Face 5-0 and 6-0, arms 4-0 and 5-0, and legs and torso 3-0 and 4-0. There will be some degree of um, surgeon's preference, obviously. So quick revision, if you look at a suture packet, you'll see that it tells you the size. This is a 4-0 and that's a 10-0 suture, so you know that this is bigger than that. It also tells you what material it is. This is proline and this is ethylone. It also tells you a bit about the needle, and we've got a separate video on needles. Do look at that, okay? Now, you have worked out the suture you want to use, but exactly which suture do you want to use for that particular patient? How do you work that out? Well, use the five W's. It'll give you a clue, okay? First thing, what am I suturing? Are you suturing skin? Are you suturing tendon? Are you suturing bowel? Okay? How long strength is required for? Do you want to use something that is absorbable? Do you want to use a non-absorbable? And that will give you a clue as to which one you want to go for. What is the optimal suture size? You know, don't be using really huge sutures because they're easy to stitch because you might be causing damage to the tissues. Don't be using really tiny sutures all the time because you think, oh, I'm a plastic surgery trainee, so I should use the smallest thing available because you can cheese wire. So you've got to have work out an optimal size. General rule, use the smallest one that will do wound support, but you don't want cheese wiring either. When should the sutures be removed? If you're using a non-absorbable, you've got to give someone a guide as to when they have to be removed. And the normal things are either 5 to 7 days or 10 to 14 days. We use 5 to 7 days for highly vascular areas like the face and the scalp because the wounds heal faster. rest of the body really 10 to 14 days. And finally, as I said, we talked about sutures today, but that's the stringy bit. You have the needles. There's a wide array of needles, different sizes, different shapes and so on. And we've got a different um, medicine and nutshell talk about videos. So do look at that. Thank you very much.